Welcome to the Council of Better Business Bureau's podcast, The Bistro, where we will discuss today's hottest consumer trends, predict the future with consumer experts, and learn how elite businesses and entrepreneurs continue to push the envelope in today's marketplace. Hello and welcome to The Bistro. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Elena Spinola. A large investment many of us make during our lifetime is the purchase of a car or cars. It can be exciting, emotional, and an expensive purchase, one that requires research, especially if you want to get a good deal. Online sites and mobile apps have revolutionized the car buying process for consumers and auto dealers. With the overload of available information, how can we be sure we're getting the best deal and the best experience when making this large purchase? On this podcast episode, we're speaking with Jack Ballinghoff, General Manager at Coons Tyson's Toyota, who will give us tips on how to approach a dealership and what you should know to ensure you get the best price and experience when buying a car. Welcome to the Bistro, Jack. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. Well, we're really excited about this podcast because it's an important one. Everyone buys a car or not, not everyone buys a car, but many of us buy a car or cars, like I said. Uh, Jack, how long have you been in the automotive industry and can you share your background in working in dealerships? Sure. Uh, I've been in the auto industry now, automobile industry now for 30 years. I graduated college locally from Georgetown University and really was broke, just like everybody else coming out of college and wanted to make some money and was very intrigued with the automotive industry. And really, for a while, just wanted to use it as a vehicle to save money, pay off student loans and go to law school. And I started working in the industry as a salesperson straight off the street. And I, I really enjoyed it. And I was going to I was actually going to leave and go back to law school, and the people that I worked for at the time, uh, they offered to let me manage the dealership, and I I took them up on that, and I thought that would be a great avenue to sort of implement some of the ideas and improvements that I I saw within the industry that I thought could make that dealership better, and and, you know, later on in my career, I see there was an early foundation of making dealerships better in general. And one of the things that I learned at Georgetown, I, I studied Middle Eastern foreign policy and diplomacy, and one of the tenets of learning there was that you learn to sit on the other side. You learn not just your perspective or view, but you, you empathize with the view and perspective of the person that you're talking to in diplomacy. And I thought that was a real valuable lesson because I could sit there and put myself in the seat and, and really know how I wanted to be treated. And that made me treat others that way. And as I managed the dealership, I would really try to empathize with the customer. Unfortunately, for a lot of times early in my career, it got me fired a lot. Okay. And... What would happen is I would take these improvements under the dealership level and we would sell more cars. Ultimately, the dealership would probably be more profitable. Customer satisfaction would definitely improve. And owners were rather critical of of me when I would run dealerships because they would look at it and go, yeah, all that's great, but if the margins were better, if you were making more per car, the dealership would be this much more profitable. And that as I was trying to remove friction within the dealership and make it a more consumer-friendly environment, I was end up with friction with the owners because I really didn't believe in that philosophically. I thought at the time that you do you make a little bit of money a lot of times and you have happy customers and they return. And the owners and, and people that I upper level management that I worked with, they were more focused on the, the, the on maximizing margins, which was not very popular ideology back then, but really is where the uh, ended up the industry ended up transforming. Yeah, well, you know, I will say one of the reasons we were so happy to have you is with 30 years in the automotive industry, obviously, you have seen changes through the years. And I also love your really strong focus on the consumer, as you said, the way you what you studied, and you learned how to see things that way. And you really implemented that in your strategy as a manager all these years. So, you know, one thing that I think most people think about when they go to buy a car is this mixed amount emotions. You know, it's such a big purchase. They're both excited and nervous about approaching the dealership. And some people, though, have negative feelings about the dealership, right? So they're excited going to buy a car. And then as they, you know, close the door, about to walk in with their partner, they're like, all right, who's going to be the good guy? Who's, you know, they think that, ooh, what's going to happen in here? Do I need to be prepare myself? Why do you think this is? Uh, mostly because the dealers earned that reputation. I think one of the things about the business, except for a few early pioneers in the automotive industry, most dealers really, they only improve customer service when they're forced to. They're really not going to necessarily become more consumer friendly unless they have to. So that that made it very uncomfortable for the customer because I think the customer could sense that. But I think what you see is it's really about informational transformation. 
in the early days and for for a, the longest time in the car business, the dealership had all the information. They knew the invoices, they knew the market, they knew the pricing, they knew what your trade was worth. They had um, a stranglehold on where you could obtain financing. A lot of banks didn't even want to do it. But a, as that informational, and, and so what they would do is they would hold that advantage and to maximize their profitability and their per transaction profitability. One of the interesting stories at the time is the only way that a consumer could actually get information, I remember early on in my career as a salesperson, was they would send a check to Consumer Reports to purchase the actual invoice, a copy of the invoice of the car they were interested in, wait three weeks, come back to the dealership, and then they'd have some leverage if the dealership was willing to work with them. The internet has changed all that. And the informa- there's, we're now more in an informational balance where the consumer does have all the information available, and they can use it to make rational decisions, and they can come in to the dealership armed. But one of the reasons that they probably are slow to, to trust the dealership is the dealerships didn't necessarily react well to the consumer having that information, and they, they reacted poorly to it, much like spoiled children. They didn't want to relinquish right. that, that informational control. It took their power away. It took, took their power away at that point. And then what's happened now is we're in sort of a – all that information's available, but – it's an Im- it's imperfectly available. Some information is more valuable, relevant, and true than other information. So that still adds a, a measure of difficulty today. Sure. Well, we are definitely going to get to that because that's a big one. Uh, in your experience working with so many people and families in the car buying process, what is it that people value most in working with a good dealership? And how can people go about approaching dealerships to know if it's a good one? I, I think you can I think one of the things that you can look for in a dealership is look for a dealership that's more concerned about helping you get the information that you want about buying a car than they are first and foremost selling you a car. You know, I, I'm always wary of dealerships that just talk about the sale or the deal or the transaction. You want a dealership that's really concerned with what do you need this for? What are you using it for? What didn't you like in your last car? What do you need this one to perform? And that way they can use the dealership's skilled personnel that know the information about the car. They can help guide that process. But if all they're interested in is, and and, and also I think a great thing to look for is if a dealership is not worried about hurrying you through the process. You know, how fast are you looking to buy? Well, that's not relevant. Isn't the most relevant thing whether I make the right decision for me and it fits my budget and I can afford it and it's the most economical choice for me. So I think first and foremost, when you start to have contacts with dealerships, whether it's through the mediums of chat, phone, internet, or even walking into the dealership, you know, how does that dealer approach you, especially when you have questions? And I think one of the things that's important, and I'll, I'll probably mention this more, is, you know, take control. Will the dealership allow you to take control of the process? Right. Well, speaking of that process, uh, you know, one of the things that many people think about when buying a car is that so maybe you've gone in, maybe you have found the car, maybe you're ready to buy it there. But then you sit through this long, painful process and lengthy paperwork. How can or how should the process there be streamlined to make it a little bit more consumer friendly, easier, quicker? Manufacturers do a lot of research on this, and pretty much all the manufacturers that I've worked for, they, they, they call it the sort of the three-hour rule. If, you're, if you have a consumer and they're in your dealership for more than three hours, it's going to be a very – probably going to be an unpleasant psychologically, psychological experience, and you're probably doing something wrong as a dealership too. Um, if it's under three hours, those are usually the best – that's sort of the sweet spot for transactions. Um, one of the things, obviously, the consumer can do is come in prepared. Do as much research as you can online. Find out about what your trade's worth. Find out about financing. Not necessarily saying you have to commit to doing anything before, but have your eyes wide open. So you have all that done. I would also say if you are prepared, if you are going into a dealership prepared to buy a car that day, have sort of the relevant documents with you too. Your insurance information, your title, your checkbook, your credit card. Make sure all the, some, some situations, proof of work, things like that, Um, maybe a pay stub or something like that. At that point, too, I think you can demand that the dealership be ready for you, too. So if you've done your research and you want to look at a specific car, a particular car, and you you know there's a model or a color or or, or a year you want to look at, tell the salesperson that I'm going to be there at 10 a.m., 
please have the car ready. I'd like to see it. Because a lot of times if that part isn't done, then when you get to the dealership, but um, for instance, my dealership, we have 1800 cars sitting on the ground and there are four different storage lots to show up and the salesperson has to go and find the car and it might be two miles away we're adding a half hour 45 minutes into the process which if we had had some heads up we, we might not have done that the other thing is about streamlining the paperwork process um, it, one of the best things that we, we that can be done is definitely look for dealerships at off-peak times um, you know, if you're going in on a Labor Day, on Labor Day at three o'clock, it's probably going to be very busy and it's going to be very difficult for the dealership to streamline that process. Gotcha. But if you're going in at 10 a.m., uh, 10 a.m. Saturday morning or Tuesday morning at 11, it, it's much easier to streamline the process because there's more people readily available. Everything from the salesperson, um, the business manager, sales managers, cleaning the car, adding accessories, all those things can be done so much easier at, at non-peak times. Gotcha. Well, that's a very specific, helpful tip. So we appreciate that. We're going to jump over a little bit to the Internet of Things because we brought that up a little earlier. You know, in this modern world of online oriented consumerism and specifically in car sales, what tips can you share to help protect people who think they can rely mainly on the Internet when buying a car? Unfortunately, the internet has become somewhat also a source of disinformation. But I wouldn't say disinformation is the real problem. It's information that's influenced by paid advertising. And it's very hard to find unbiased sources when you're doing research online. Uh, I tell a story. Um, Motor Trend, which is a respected automotive magazine, every year they have their car of the year. In 2016, it was the, the truck of the year was the Chevrolet Colorado. But if you open up the front of Motor Trend, that issue, which I have here in front of me, the first four pages are a glossy four-page pullout celebrating the 21 cars that have been named Car of the Year by Motor Trend. And one of them was the Chevrolet Corvair in 1960, which is highlighted in their advertisement saying this was the Car of the Year. But I, I think the car maker must have some belief that the consumer has a short institutional memory. The Chevrolet Corvair was the launch of consumerism in America with the Ralph Nader's book, Unsafe at Any Speed. So it's funny that they would use an ad like that, but do you question how much influence a paid four-page cover ad has on naming something car of the year, truck of the year, to influence prospective purchasers. So it's very hard to disseminate in, on the internet who's paid and who's not. In the days, in these era of retargeting and all these other ad techniques, it's very difficult. That's a great point. So don't believe every single thing you see on the internet, of course. So you're gonna find a lot of information on the internet when you're looking to buy a car, but make sure you get in there, speak with someone, use your gut about how the trust that you're building with this individual. And uh, yeah, maybe don't believe everything you see, because it could just be an ad, a paid for. Ad. I'll give you another great example. Is I, I, I was what you see something on TV all the time. They say uh, JD Power initial quality survey is as a reason why to people 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 should buy your product. It's a brand new car. There shouldn't be any product quality issues. So uh, where do you get that data from, and how relevant is it that uh, your new car performs like a new car? Right, right. <laughs> so, Jack, what then would you consider good, unbiased sources of information? Great question. Um, one of the first and foremost that I've always relied on, and I think has probably been one, the, been one of the most valuable ones to consumers, has been consumer reports. They take no paid advertising. They have a test campus um, where they test products, and they've always been unbiased, and they've always been able to, for years, to keep themselves above the fray, so so to speak. The other thing that's great about consumer reports is they don't just tell you. They, they'll, they don't just tell you about today's cars. They're also going to, they also gather valuable data on how cars age and the reliability factors much longer into their life cycles. I, I would, I, I often tell people Better Business Bureau is great because how you work with businesses and how businesses reciprocate that is very, very important. But I think there's some grassroots sources too. People like trusted mechanics and gas stations and garages, they're great. Your insert insurance agent is a great source. They can tell you loss ratios, claims, accident and, and injury uh, claim rates on, on vehicles. I would also use, say use many of the resale value websites, Kelly Blue Book, Edmunds.com because I think it's important that you know how your car depreciates over time. What will it be worth in three years? And that's valuable information. One of the things that, that the salespeople that work for me, many of them use, they actually don't just go to crash test ratings. They'll actually get online, 
fine crash test videos and show people what the vehicles look like in that collision so that people can actually envision a real world scenario. Gotcha. Well, these are really helpful and it lends itself to people doing a little bit of homework on the on the car before they come in. What other kinds of homework should people do before walking into a dealership that will empower them specifically when it comes to the price negotiations? Great question. And a, a very interesting response I think I have for that is if you're going to a dealership under the premise to, to negotiate and they're bringing you on on the premise that you can negotiate, I would say run away. In the internet age, all good dealerships that are transparent and work with consumers put their best price online out there for the consumer to see and shop, knowing that it's a very competitive marketplace. A dealership that, does it, that is encouraging you to negotiate is trying to avoid giving you their best price. And what they hope to do is bring you in there and never have to give you their best price. Remember, they do this day in, day out. They're the professionals. They're the ones that hold the tactics that can move the shells around and change the scenery. And consumers doing this once every few years aren't adept at actually reacting well to that and often get taken advantage of or pay more or slightly more than they should. Gotcha. Well, thank you. That was really what this whole podcast was about, giving people really specific tips so that they can have the best car buying experience uh, and be happy and come back. Jack, this has been so helpful. Uh, where can people find more information about your dealership? You can find out about it on coons.com. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's been my pleasure. The Better Business Bureau is deeply committed to building and advancing a better marketplace, a trusted marketplace for all because trust always matters. For the Better Business Bureau and as your host of The Bistro, I'm Elena Spinola, and I thank you for listening. I encourage you to give us your feedback on this episode, and until next time, it's been my pleasure discussing better business with you. You just enjoyed The Bistro Podcast. Be sure to tune in next month for a brand new episode. To learn more about our other shows, visit betterbusiness.blueberry.com. That's betterbusiness.blubrry.com. Dot com and subscribe. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the Better Business Bureau, Council of Better Business Bureaus, or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Blueberry's Terms of Service.